Hello doctors, very good evening to all of you. So let's start this orthopedic section of surgery. Today will be the session 6 of uh, surgery. So starting with this orthopedics, fractures are always diagnosed with an x-ray. In terms of therapy, general rules are. So we have to diagnose of course uh, by doing this x-ray. And in terms of therapy, general rules are close reduction. We can go for close reduction. We can go for open reduction, internal fixation. We can go for open fractures. Uh, if in case of open fractures, then what we, have, what we will do. So in case of close reduction, mild fractures without displacement. So those patients who are having mild fractures in which there is no displacement, in those we can go for close reduction. When we will offer open reduction internal fixation in case of severe fractures with displacement or misalignment of bone pieces. Whenever there is misalignment of bone pieces or whenever there are severe fractures, only in that case we will go for open reduction internal fixation. Open fractures, skin must be closed and the bone must be set in the operating room with deprivation. If there is an open fracture, then we have to go for what? If skin must be closed in those cases and bone must be set in the operating room with deprivation. We have to deprive it, we have to close it and skin must be closed in case of open fracture. So these three things we have to keep in our mind. Now coming towards fractures, there are five main types of fractures, all of which present with pain, swelling and deformity. Now these five types of fractures are number one, commutative fractures. What are commutative fractures? A fracture in which the bone gets broken into multiple pieces. So if we can see if the bone gets broken into multiple pieces, we can say this is commutative fractures and most commonly it's because of crash injuries. Whenever there is a case of crash injury, we can see this commutative fractures. Now number two fractures categories is stress fractures. A complete fracture from repetitive insults to the bone. In question, most common stress fracture is, the, is of the metatarsal. This is the most common question. They usually ask, what is the most common stress fracture? That we will say it's, it will be of metatarsals. On the USMLE Step 2, CK vignettes may describe an athlete with persistent pain. So you can keep this in, in mind that whenever there is a case of athlete with persistent pain, there may be a case of stress fracture. Because why? This is because of repetitive insults to the bone. Now, X-ray does not show evidence, so a CT or MRI must be conducted in order for diagnosis. So, if you won't find anything on X-ray, maybe you can go for CT or maybe, maybe you can go for MRI in order to diagnose. Now, for the treatment point of view, treatment is with rehabilitation, reduced physical activity and casting. We will go for the reduced physical activity, we'll advise patient not to exercise and not to do sternus heavy uh, this physical activity. And we'll go for the rehabilitation program, we'll go for the casting. If persistent, then of course at last we thought we have surgery. So surgery is indicated if persistent with the, uh, uh, you have all that with the rehabilitation, reduce physical activity and casting. And if, if still there is no improvement, then we can, we can go for surgery. Now third category of fracture is compression fractures. A specific fracture of the vertebra in the setting of osteoporosis. If there is a setting of osteoporosis in which if we can see there is specific fracture of the vertebra because of osteoporosis, process we can say this is one of a compression fracture approximately one third of osteoporotic vertebral injuries are lumbar one third are thoraco lumbar and one third are thoracic in nature so lumbar thoracic and thoraco lumbar one one third each this is this is what this is actually a specific fracture of the vertebra that is compression fractures the fourth category is pathologic fracture a fracture that occurs from minimal trauma to the bone that is weakened by disease so of course there must be a preceded disease and because of the disease the because of the disease, if there is a fracture that occurs only just because of minimal trauma, because already that that the disease is actually weakened the patient's bone, and because of minimal trauma of the bone fracture, then we can say this is pathology fracture. Say for example, in the case of metastatic carcinoma, for example, breast or colon cancer, they metastasize to uh, towards bone, and of course they weaken the bone, and by a minimal pressure, minimal trauma, the bone can fracture. In case of multiple myeloma, in case of pigeon disease, a few examples of disease that cause brittle bones. And brittle bones can easily be fractured. Now, on the USMLE step 2, so you can look for a V-net in which an older person fractures a rib from coughing. So, coughing, there may be a pathology which is responsible for that older person uh, fractures rib, right? Now, treatment is surgical realignment of the bone and treatment of the underlying disease. We have to treat the underlying disease and we have to go for surgical realignment in that case. Now for fifth category is open fracture. For the open fracture, a fracture when injury causes a broken bone to pierce the skin. 
So if the, in, in this case, in this case of fracture, injury causes a broken bone to pierce the skin. An open fracture is associated with high rate of bacterial infection to the surrounding tissue. Of course, there is piercement. So we'll see high rate of bacterial infection in these cases. And surgery is always the right answer in case of open fractures. Now we can see here, there is a compression fracture here. You can see vertebral fracture, right? Especially at the level of L4. Here you can see. All right, now we're coming towards shoulder injuries. Shoulder injuries, we have anterior shoulder dislocation, we have posterior shoulder dislocation, clavicular fracture, stiffoid fracture. So we are going to discuss about their etiologies, their positive organisms, their sign and symptoms, what are, the, what are the diagnostic tests we are going to offer for these conditions and what are the best suited treatment option available. So first of all, we have anterior shoulder dislocation. So what is the etiology of anterior shoulder dislocation? There may be any injury that causes strain on the glenohumeral ligament, right? So any strain, any injury, Injury that can cause uh, this strain on the glenohumeral ligament that can lead to anterior shoulder dislocation and that this is considered to be one of the most common type and more than 95% cases in which we are going to see this anterior shoulder dislocation. So what are the signs and symptoms how your patient is going to present if he or she is having anterior shoulder dislocation. There will be arm held to the side with externally rotated forearm with severe pain. So the, there is severe pain, the patient arm is externally rotated, forearm actually, forearm is externally rotated and arm held to the side, right? So how we are going to diagnose this case, if it's a case of anterior shoulder dislocation, you will go for the x-ray, x-ray is considered to be the best initial test and MRI is the most accurate test. We should know what is the best initial and what is the most accurate test. So best initial is x-ray while the most accurate is MRI. Must rule out axillary artery or nerve injury. We have to rule out this. We have to rule out this whether it's a case of maxillary uh, whether in, in this anterior shoulder dislocation axillary artery is involved or there is injury to the nerve we have to rule out it right and for the treatment option we'll go for the shoulder relocation and immobilization. We'll immobilize the patient and we will go for shoulder relocation. Now in case of posterior shoulder dislocation, posterior shoulder dislocation what is the main etiology? There must be seizure or electrical burn that can cause posterior shoulder dislocation and how uh, the patient is going to present there must be arm which is medially rotated and held to the side side uh, held to the side arm but it is medially rotated then you can say it's a posterior shoulder dislocation of course for the best initial testing you will go for the x-ray and for the most accurate mri and what you are going to do for the treatment option you will go for traction and surgery if pulses or sensation are diminished during physical examination if we do the physical examination and if we see pulses and sensations are lost or diminished then we can go for traction and surgery now for the case of clavicular fracture there must be a history of trauma and what the patient's most important symptom there must be pain over location and what you're going to do for the diagnostic testing you will do the x-ray x-ray is the best test must rule out subclavian artery brachial plexus injury if it's a clavicular fracture you have to rule out as whether there is any injury to the subclavian artery or if there is any injury to the brachial plexus and we'll go for the simple arm sling simple arm sling is the treatment option for clavicular fracture and see whenever there is anterior shoulder dislocation you have to rule out axillary artery or axillary nerve injury so this ruling out of this axillary artery and axillary nerve injury is important in case of anterior shoulder dislocation and in case and in case of clavicular fracture we have to rule out if any subclavian artery or brachial plexus injury is there. Now the scaphoid fracture. Scaphoid fracture, what is the etiology? If the falling on an outstretched hand. So if a patient falls on an outstretched hand, then we can say this is a scaphoid fracture and uh, they can, can cause scaphoid fracture and how the patient is going to present, there must be persistent pain in the anatomical snuff box, right? This is the anatomical snuff box which is in between the tendons. Shami, can you please close the door? Thank you. Now, x-ray won't show results for three weeks. So, three weeks, x-ray won't be able to show any result if there is any scaphoid fracture. And what you are going to do, you will do thumb spike casting. That will be the treatment option. So, here the main important thing is the pain, persistent pain will be there in patient anatomical snuff box. Right? And x-ray won't show results for three weeks. And what is the main history behind that? There must be a falling on outstretched hand history as a of scaphoid fracture. Now question is a 39 year old woman uh, walked from a nap with severe pain in her index finger and found it to be flexed while other fingers were extended. When she tried to pull it free, she heard a, heard a 
loud popping sound and the pain subsided. The following day she comes to her doctor's office concerned about the sound and the pain. What is the most appropriate next step in the management? Not next stop. <laughs> what is the most appropriate next step in the management of this patient? What are you going to do, right? She is 39. She is having severe pain in her index finger, right? So here what you are going to do? They, are, they have written as like steroid injection. Why? Because trigger finger. Trigger finger because the finger is flexed while other fingers are extended. Were extended. And when she tried to pull it free, so heard a loud popping sound. So this actually finger, that is her index finger, is considered to be a trigger finger. Trigger finger is an acutely flexed and painful finger. Steroid injection have been shown to decrease pain and recurrence of trigger finger. It is the most cost-effective treatment and studies have shown a trial of steroids should be attempted prior to surgery. So whenever any finger is flexed and rest of the fingers are extended, then flex finger is considered to be a trigger finger. It may be any finger, right? It's not like that only always index finger is involved. It may be any finger and you are going to see that that finger is actually flexed and this is known as trigger finger. So we must remember that in case of this flex finger, in case of this trigger finger, we have to administer steroids. That's the best suited option. Now, trigger finger is caused by stenosis of the tendon sheath leading to the finger in question. If a steroid fails, then we'll go for surgery to cut the sheath that is restricting the tendon is the definitive treatment. So for the pain and recurrence, we'll go for the steroids. But if after the use of the steroid is still, there's a stenosis of the tendon sheath and because of that, the symptoms persist, it means that we have to go for surgical option. Now this point to ponder for clavicular fracture figure 8, slings are no longer used as their outcomes have not been shown to be any better than a simple arm sling. So it means that simple arm sling is better as compared to figure 8 slings in case of clavicular fracture. Previously we will go for this figure 8 slings but nowadays it's just only simple arm sling. Now again point to ponder, do not confuse trigger finger with dupuytren contracture because in case of dupuytren contracture, condition more common in men aged more than 40 and dupuytren contracture is when the palm of fascia becomes constricted and the hand can no longer be properly extended upon and surgery is the only effective therapy. So in case of trigger finger, there is a flexion of that particular finger but in case of dupuytren contracture, it is actually a palm of fascia which is and the hand can no longer be properly extended upon. In, right and we'll go only for, for the surgical option in case of this now achilles tendon rupture rupture of the achilles tendon present as a sudden snap in the lower calf associated with acute severe pain and inability to walk it usually occurs after uh, trauma or fall the most accurate diagnostic test is mri so for this achilles tendon rupture we go for the mri and uh, what are the basic uh, findings of this sudden snap in the lower calf associated with acute pain and inability to walk the patient is unable to walk the best therapy is surgical repair of the achilles tendon in elderly patient however casting and pain management are also considered so we'll go for the pain management we'll go for the casting but you have to consider the best therapy is surgical repair this therapy is surgical repair now we're coming towards osteoarthritis of the knee very important point osteoarthritis of the knee is a chronic non-inflammatory arthritis of the synovial joint caused by wear and tear the classic presentation is a patient with joint pain there must be crafters and difficulty bearing weight on the affected knee you know, if it's if we are considering if we are talking about the osteoarthritis of knee that's why we are saying that difficulty bearing weight on the affected knee in this case and diagnosed with history and physical examination confirmed with x which will show joint space narrowing and dense subchondral bone. When you do the x-ray, you will see there is sub uh, dense subchondral bone and there is joint space narrowing, right? Conservative management include physical therapy, we will go for analgesic, we will go for intraarticular injections. However, most patients will ultimately require a knee replacement. Most of the time, we have to go for the knee replacement, but in the meantime, for the conservative management, we can go for the physical therapy, we can go for the painkillers or intraarticular injections of steroids. Now, when do we answer knee replacement? Any elective knee replacement is indicated when a patient develops severe symptoms. You will always go for elective knee replacement when, when there are severe symptoms. That is difficulty walking, inability to perform adult life activities or bone-on-bone -on -bone disease seen on x-ray. So in all of these conditions, we will go for knee replacement. 
The question is, a 19-year-old woman broke her femur three days ago during a college soccer tryout. This morning, her mother brought her to the emergency department because she was short of breath. Physical examination reflects a confused patient who is awake but not alert or oriented and a splotchy magnetic rash around the base of the neck and back. AVG reveals partial pressure confusion under 60. What is the most likely diagnosis? Whenever there is an injury, there is a fracture of the long bones like femur, always consider this fat embolism. Fat embolism syndrome is characterized by a combination of confusion. There may be critical rashes like here in this case, and this near difficulty in breathing, chocolate soda like here in this case, and it's caused by fracture of long bones. Myocardial infarction may have shortness of breath. We have to rule out this myocardial infarction, but it's unlikely in a 19-year-old woman. And we know very well, menstruating women, they are less likely to have myocardial infarction because of the estrogen activity estrogen protect the hearts that's why it's rare to have a myocardial infarction in menstruating women or in such young age pancreatitis would present in the severe abdominal pain which is not a feature here. Rhabdomyolysis have high CPK for muscle breakdown with a urinalysis and dipstick that show positive blood fit fewer than 5 RBC which is not a case here. So it's here it's fat embolism. So what is fat embolism? Fracture of the long bone allows for fat to escape as little vesicles and cause occlusion or vasculature throughout the body. So whenever there is a fracture of the long bone like femur is fractured, what will happen? The fat will release in a form of little vesicle and it's going to occlude the vessel throughout the body. And the most common bone is the femur, right? That's the long bone. The onset of symptom is within five days of fracture. The patient will present with, they may be confusion, they may be critical rashes on the upper extremity and trunk, there may be shortness of breath, or the kept neck or the neck. So these are all the presenting features whenever there is occlusion because of this little tiny fat vesicles. Now for the diagnostic testing, we'll go for the ABGs and ABGs always show partial pressure of oxygen which is under 60 and that is the case here in this question. In this question, the patient oxygen saturation was less than 60. Now chest x-ray will show infiltrates and urinalysis may show fat droplets so that will help you in confirming the diagnosis of fat embolism. You will see the chest x-ray will show infiltrates and you will see the urinalysis which, which will show fat droplets. Now for the treatment, for the treatment of fat embolism require oxygen to keep partial pressure oxygen over 95%. Definitely your oxygen is 60 or less than 60% will go for oxygen treatment, right? If the patient becomes severely hypoxic, intubation followed by mechanical ventilation if necessary. If it's too hypoxic, we'll intubate it and we'll give her or him mechanical ventilation. Now, a 66-year-old man come to his uh, PCP with bilateral lack pain of several months duration. All right, and the pain seems to be worse when he has to walk several blocks and it improves when he sits down. Leaning forward on a bench or shopping cart, etc. alleviates the pain. So leaning forward elevates the pain and he is a non-smoker. The pain seems to be worse when he has to walk several blocks and he's come to his PCP with bilateral lack pain of several months duration. Primary care physician, this PCP, <laughs> first I was thinking of pneumocystis carried pneumonia. Of course, that's not here. That is not the thing here. It's PCP here is primary care physician. So he comes to his primary care physician with bilateral lack pain of several months duration. So what is the most appropriate next diagnostic step? What you're going to do here? Because here, the um, when he sits down, the pain is improved when he went forward, like bench on a bench or shopping cart, etc. Elevates the pain, right? And it's a bilateral pain of several months. So here, the most appropriate next diagnostic. They're not asking you the initial one. They're asking you the most appropriate so for the most appropriate will go for spine mri why because this is a case of pseudoclaudication secondary to spinal stenosis that's a typical presentation it's a case of pseudoclaudication why because secondary to spinal stenosis there may be spinal stenosis and because of that there is pseudoclaudication and which is the case here the best test for spinal stenosis is an mri we'll go for mri and while the symptoms sound like claudication they're equal bilaterally indicating a spinal etiology rather than vascular. So it's not a vascular etiology here, it's a spinal etiology. Furthermore, the pain is elevated by leaning forward and see the pain is elevated by leaning forward. So spinal flexion op opens the spinal canal and relieves nerve root compression. That's why on leaning forward or benching for, uh, or, you know, bench forward, leaning forward would not help vascular claudication symptoms. Here, here you can see uh, leaning forward alleviates the pain, right? So here also spinal flexion opens the spinal canal and relieves nerve root compression. That is the case. And leaning forward would not help vascular claudication. It will only help 
this type of claudication which is pseudo pseudo claudication which is actually secondary to spinal stenosis if it's a vascular claudication the leaning forward would not help so this is a point of differentiation so leaning forward it means that it's not a case of vascular claudication it's a case of pseudo claudication which is secondary to spinal stenosis now we are dealing with the spinal stenosis in detail spinal stenosis occur when the arthritic changes narrow the spinal canal at which level at l1 and c2 so if you see arthritic changes which is actually narrowing the spinal canal at l1 and c2 we can say this is spinal stenosis symptoms include neck and back pain there may be bilateral lag of buttock pain and numbness and pseudo claudication now symptoms worsen with walking and improve with spinal flexion so these are the important features the pain will improve with spinal fraction and the pain will become worse with walking you have to diagnose spinal stenosis with the help of mri and you have to treat your patient either by giving answers or by doing surgery that's the only option we have now herniated disc of disease the disease arises when the intervertebral disc herniates see there is herniation of intervertebral disc compressing the spinal nerve root and the condition is most frequently seen in the elderly and etiology is often associated with a lifting injury there must be a history of something heavy weight lifting because of this herniation is occurred the principal symptom is electric pain following a dermatome distribution we can see here in this case in a case of herniated disc there is a symptom known as electric pain following a dermatome distribution dermatome area of the skin supplied by the same spinal nerve so spinal nerve which runs along the uh, muscle there will be electric pain uh, there will be a shooting of electric pain there so diagnose with streck leg raise testing if red flags are present you have to consider an mi and you have to manage your patient with answers and activity modification that is only for red flag symptom those are symptom symptomatic and we have to go for we have to diagnose this by doing a straight leg raise test right there we can see herniation especially okay all right here some left all right now a 41 year old man presents to the emergency department after acute onset of lower back pain that began after he tried to lift an engine block at his job he says he feels like lightning bolts is shooting down his legs and is unable to move physical examination reveals a positive straight leg raise test and positive ankle wing fall so what is the most appropriate next diagnostic step so you have already done with the physical examination you have already done with the straight leg raise test now they are asking you the most appropriate one so the most important the most accurate the most appropriate one is mri so we'll go for the mri of the spine here a patient who present with acute onset of back pain and is under the age of 50 should have an mri to rule out spinal cord compression due to a slip disc or a lumbar disc herniation we want to rule out whether it's a slip disc or whether it's a lumbar disc herniation so in order to do that we have to go for mri if asked for the most appropriate next step in management you have to answer anti inflammatory anti inflammatory agent because why we want to give the pain relief the most common side of lumbar disc herniation are l4 and l5 and l5 and s1 the other choices are applicable but the most appropriate next step is an mri we we'll go for the mri that is considered to be the most applicable next step appropriate next step lumbar puncture however has no role in the treatment of slip disc so if it if it has no role we will not go for that so here the correct answer is mri of the spine which is mri of the spine which is considered to be the most appropriate next diagnostic testing and we're coming towards compartment syndrome compartment syndrome is due to compression of nerves and blood vessels and muscle inside a closed space and this can also be within a cast or after setting a fracture the six signs of compartment syndrome there are six signs of compartment syndrome one is pain number two paler most commonly thank you number 1 is pain most commonly the first symptom number 2 paler lack of blood flow causes pale skin number 3 sparesthesia that is pain in the needle sensation number 4 paralysis inability to move the limb number 5 pulselessness lack of the two pulses and number 6 is coclothermia that is cold to the touch so pain paler paresthesia paralysis pulselessness and coclothermia six p's are there right so these six p's are actually the main signs of compartment syndrome now compartment syndrome is a medical emergency it's not a surgical emergency it's a medical emergency and immediate fasciotomy must be completed in order to relieve pressure before necrosis occur so before necrosis we have to go for fasciotomy because if we delay there will there will be ischemia there will be lack of blood supply and because of that it can go into irreversible injury and will lead to necrosis so we have to prevent it so it's a medical emergency we have to go for immediate fasciotomy must be completed in order to relieve pressure before 
necrosis occurs. If there is an algorithm showing compartment syndrome sign and symptom, first of all, there are early findings and there are late findings. What are the early findings? In early findings, the patient must be feeling pain and paresthesia, pain severe worse with muscle stretch, paler, pale skin from decreased blood flow. Of course, whenever there is decreased blood flow, there will be paler, paresthesia, pins and needles, nerve involvement is showing. Now, late findings include poiclothermia and pulselessness. Or why poiclothermia? Why cold due to decrease blood flow and why paralysis? Because of inability to move distal musculation. What is pulselessness? That's the absent distal pulses ominous finding, right? So, uh, most of the time in these patients, there are absent distal pulses. So, this pulselessness, paralysis, poiclothermia are considered to be the late findings and pain, paler, and paresthesia are considered to be early findings. Now, for the knee trauma, Cases, a 19-year-old man takes a hard blow from the ongoing, oncoming defense during his second college football game. He complains of severe progressive pain in his knee and has difficulty ambulating. He is seen by the team doctor who tells him to ice the knee. A week later, the pain and swelling are still present. His family doctor orders an MRI that shows a torn anterior cruciate ligament. So actually, anterior cruciate ligament is torn here. Now, what is the best therapy? We know the case. We know the diagnosis. There is a torn anterior cruciate ligament. You just need to repair it. So what is the best therapy? We'll go for arthroscopic repair. Arthroscopic repair is the most definitive therapy followed by rehabilitation and the risk factor that should be considered is that he had direct trauma to the front of his knee. The mechanism of injury can give some insight into the type of problem that may subsequently arise. So this is considered to be the risk factor. So we have to go for arthroscopic repair whenever there is anterior cruciate ligament tear. Right. So this is a torn especially a torn ACL seen during an arthroscopic repair. All right. Now, for the knee injuries, we have medial and lateral collateral ligament injury. We have anterior cruciate ligament injury. We have posterior cruciate ligament injury. We have meniscal injury. So, what are the etiology? What are the signs and symptoms? How are we going to diagnose? What are the treatment options? We are going to discuss it now. For the case of medial and lateral collateral ligament injury, whenever there is medial and lateral, both collateral ligaments injury are there, there must be a case of trauma to the opposite side of the injury. So, it may be because of trauma to the opposite side of the injury. Where there is an injury and or to the opposite of that side, there will be ligamental injury like medial lateral, medial and lateral collateral ligament. Like if it's a medial side, the lateral will, will be damaged. If it's a lateral side, medial will be damaged. And of course, pain will be there. You have to go for MRI for the exact diagnosis and you have to surgically repair it. You have no choice. For the anterior cruciate, there will be direct trauma to the knee. So if there is a vignette regarding this anterior cruciate, they must be giving you a clue that there is direct trauma to the knee. If it's written direct trauma to the knee, you should always consider anterior cruciate ligament tear in your mind. And signs and symptoms will be pain and positive, right? And MRI, you have to go for the diagnosis and of course arthroscopic repair will go for the surgical option. And see, this is pain and positive anterior drawer sign. So, anterior drawer sign is actually positive here in case of anterior cruciate. You just need to remember if it's anterior cruciate um, injury, you will see anterior drawer sign. If it's a posterior cruciate ligament injury, there will be a posterior drawer sign. You will be pain and positive posterior drawer sign. And there is always a direct trauma to the knee. So, anterior also direct trauma to the knee, posterior also. But in case of anterior, there is pain and positive anterior drawer sign. But in case of posterior, there will be positive posterior drawer sign and of course you have to go for MRI and you have to go for arthroscopic repair. For the meniscal injury, there is traumatic injury of the knee. There should be trauma to the knee and popping sound upon flexion and extension. So if you are just going to have popping sound during flexion and during extension, you can say this is maybe because of meniscal injury. You have to go for MRI and you have to go for arthroscopic repair. So anterior cruciate ligament injury is the most common knee ligament injury. This is a very important point to ponder that anterior cruciate ligament is a tip for us actually. Anterior cruciate ligament injury is the most common ligament injury. And we're coming towards hydro adenitis suppurativa. This is HS. HS is a chronic inflammatory condition involving occluded apocrine glands and hair follicle that is characterized by painful cutaneous draining lesions and there will be abscesses, there will be sinuses and the exact pathogenesis is not fully known but some multiple risk factors play a role. So actually the apocrine glands are involved here and this is one of the chronic inflammation, apocrine glands and hair follicles are involved here and there will be painful cutaneous draining lesions in that case and abscesses in this case and sinuses in this case. Now the exact pathogenesis is not fully known but multiple risk factors play a role including there may be obesity or smoking or family history they can all play 
this uh, hydrodinitis operativa can affect the axilla most common side. It may, fall, it may also affect in one area or inner thighs and perianal and perineal areas, but most likely, most common side is the most favorable side is axilla. So our diagnosis of HS is straightforward. In patient would demonstrate the constellation of recurrent inflammatory nodules, the sign of tracts, and hypertrophic scarring in intragenous areas like axilla, like in guanid areas, like inner thighs, and perianal and perineal areas. We can always think of this HS. Now for the man management option, we can initially will go for tobacco cessation. We'll uh, advise for the weight loss. We'll go for the topical antibiotic cover and major to keep the skin clean and friction free. Our skin should be clean and it should be friction free. If initial measures do not help, a short course of antibiotic is considered. For example, we can go for the tetracycline if, um, if initial measures don't help. An antibiotic refractory worsening disease, if it's antibiotic refractory worsening disease, we'll go for TNF alpha inhibitors and surgery are considered. So definitely in case of refractory cases, in case of worsening cases, in case of worsening disease, we'll go for the TNF alpha inhibitors and we can go for the surgery. That will be the management point of view. Alright, so we are done with the orthopedic section. Tomorrow, inshallah, we are going to do this urology. Uh, uh, urology of this, we are doing all these in surgery, right? And uh, separately also we have to cover it. Okay, thank you so much. Now it's time for your call session.